So next up, we have Carol from Drive.ai and Jessica Lesson moderating. Welcome, Carol. So I think we're going to kick things off with a little video. This is somewhere in the Bay Area. Yeah. Uh, we condensed uh, 30 minutes of driving. It was um, just a very quick video. We did not anticipate it raining as hard as it did in California. So it took us about a week to, uh, on the software side to adapt to a rain condition. And thank goodness on our hardware side, uh, we made the call to make it waterproof uh, last year. That so. <laughs> seems like a good box to check. In, in, um, awesome. So um, first, I'd love to familiarize everyone um, with Drive.ai, a little bit of background about your history, and then I'm excited to talk about where you think um, what we need to do collectively as a group or an industry to get these cars on the road. And as um, we've talked about earlier today, to go from, I guess, the racetracks and the Bostons of the world and the Singapores to something deployed more widely. Um, but so you're one of the, the co-founders of Drive came out of Stanford a couple of years ago. Um, Why do you guys start the company? Yeah, so uh, Stanford's had a long history with autonomous vehicles. Uh, uh, they, you know, from Sebastian Thrun's lab, had uh, sprung out uh, Google X and the self-driving car project. Uh, you've got Andrew Ng, who is the champion of uh, deep learning for self-driving cars uh, and started Google Brain. You also have Chris Gerdes group, uh, which is on the mechanical engineering side. So. Um, the, the, the teams at Stanford has, have always uh, bridged uh, the intersection of AI and self-driving vehicles. Uh, this, is, uh, this startup started two years ago. Uh, the team members had, uh, uh, we had a large founding team. Uh, you know, six of the teammates came from the Stanford AI lab. Mm -hmm and had been working together some up to five years and had major breakthroughs. Uh, the OEMs, it was really interesting in the sense that uh, when I was brought on to help them bridge uh, research into commercialization, uh, I've never sat in meetings uh, at graduate school where there's both uh, OEMs and tier ones and then also VCs on the other side of the table uh, listening to weekly meetings to figure out, uh, you know, can we, uh, by this technology, because we did have state-of-the-art perception at that time. Uh, so the team started uh, two years ago, and it felt really, it was a really, really exciting time because we were at that cusp of a new type of technology uh, that really stepped up AI, and we were able to solve perception um, in a way that hadn't, that level of accuracy had not been seen before. And this is, you know, uh, this is roughly uh, around the year 2011 where uh, deep learning started, uh, you know, breaking down uh, every benchmark from speech recognition to ImageNet, and uh, what we saw uh, was that we were the domain experts in the uh, artificial intelligence space for self-driving vehicles, and we really bridged the software-hardware gap, mm -hmm. and that was one of the reasons why we started. It was really this intersection that had happened. Awesome. And have you guys said how much money you've raised, or who some of your investors are? Uh, so we've been, uh, I guess, uh, more discreet on the capital side. Uh, uh, we did start off with a large uh, Series A round, and uh, uh, we have gotten uh, uh, quite significant capital uh, at this point. So we do have a runway of uh, over two years at this point. Got it. Yeah. Uh, so you talked about deep learning, and we've heard this morning a couple different point of views about how um, whether it's best applied in discrete areas or can really be mm. used in end-to-end, -end. and you guys are big believers in the end-to-end. -end. Um, uh, oh, I'll make a correction on that. So we're a uh, deep learning first company, so mm. we really believe uh, in, you know, we were lucky to start with a clean slate. We didn't have legacy code of a rules-based system, uh, you know, uh, right when we had the breakthrough. Our entire infrastructure, which is so important uh, if you choose a deep learning approach, um, our, com our whole company uh, software stack is based on how do you optimize for a deep learning approach. Mm -hmm. If I say deep learning first, that also imp uh, implies it's a hybrid approach where there are rules. Uh, so things like uh, speed limits, mm -hmm. we don't uh, you learn. You don't try and gather data and Come out, okay. Yeah, and try Good to, to guess what the speed limit is. I awesome. think uh, <laughs> those those type of things uh, we do have rules for. Uh -huh. uh, where we utilize deep learning, is, it is not an end-to-end -end approach, which is very difficult to test and get through validation. Uh -huh. um, 
uh, you know, what we do is separate it out into testable modules where you understand inputs and you have predictable outputs. Uh, I came from a robotics background, uh, over 17 years in highly regulated robotics fields. Uh, this uh, from underwater space, I worked uh, 15 years uh, in surgical robotics, uh, intuitive surgical. Um, so this is actually the shortest amount of uh, time for a regulated product <laughs> that I've been in. So, uh, so to get through uh, V and V uh, is a pattern that we've seen across many different industries in robotics. So your um, approach is basically sort of going to be to retrofit existing yeah. fleets. So talk a bit about why you went with that um, as your first approach to the market. Yeah, so at Drive, we really have uh, built an infrastructure to optimize for speed and scale. And those are the two pillars at Drive on how we make decisions. Uh, you know, that's why we chose a deep learning first approach. It allows us to be able to more quickly scale to different vehicle platforms. Uh, you know, we currently operate uh, and have in-house three different platforms of different makes and sizes. A uh, plat so a platform would be uh, like a certain type of car. Yeah, different types of shapes and sizes uh, in manufacturers. Got it. Um, we uh, are able to, uh, you know, we want to work with uh, different business fleets, and that's a fast way to roll this technology out onto the market. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you work with business fleets, it enables data to come back at scale for us to process. Uh, it also allows us to put out a product into the real world, and I think that's the missing piece right now. There's been so many prototypes, so many R&D projects, uh, you know, at Drive, it's really getting this, you know, first impact into the real world. Uh, people talk about crossing the chasm and mainstream and 100% autonomous cars. We're not even at 1%. We are in, you know, small bubbles around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and we use the analogy that autonomous driving is not going to be deployed overnight, but it's going to be more like cell phone coverage, where uh, it, you will start mm -hmm. expanding your autonomous driving network. And it's really a global race of figuring out who are the right partners and who are the uh, the right cities to deploy in. So what kind of partners are you interested in working with or are working with? Yes, uh, so there's different types of partners that, uh, that are needed to bring a product out. Uh, and someone had brought up the question earlier of uh, the value of working with partners and where the value stack is. Uh, we, we do see uh, a partnership, uh, and we do have strong partnerships with uh, several different OEMs at this point because what their strength is is uh, integration and be able to sell it at scale. We are starting with retrofit kits. It's the fastest way. We also are using off-the-shelf hardware uh, sensors. We're not making our own LiDAR. Um, so that's one bet that we're making because uh, we have uh, multiple sensors that we are uh, doing sensor fusion and solving the problem of uh, really the software problem is mm -hmm. where our strength is. Mm -hmm. uh, the other type of partner that we see are business fleets. Yeah. And what Drive is working on is uh, we see this really transformative shift that's happening for businesses, not just OEMs, uh, not just ride sharing companies, but ev the future we see is that most companies are going to become mobile. These mom and pop shops, we want to make self-driving cars accessible. Uh, and we're starting with businesses first in certain areas, solving real pain points for them and making sure that the average uh, person on the road gets used to and accepts and adopts uh, uh, autonomous driving. And for the fleet kind of testing, I mean, what sort of distances are you talking about? And, and are there, I mean, what, are there constraints in, from a regulatory perspective or where you can even test in the B2B? Realm. Yeah, so uh, we're starting in um, metropolitan areas that uh, deal with uh, pedestrians walking around crowded situations. Um, you know, we're also able to to drive uh, safely on the on the highway and long distances. But at this point in time, we, we're figuring out the strongest use cases and uh, you know answering just really basic fundamental questions to learn as quickly as possible. You know, is the most valuable autonomous route uh, the ones that are most heavily utilized, or is it actually the ones that are the least utilized? That instead of sending a human driver to drive, you know, down to the uh, the boondocks, like you would send an autonomous car there instead. Mm -hmm. uh, and so our approach uh, allows for that. 
uh, you know, we make bets where you don't need perfectly mapped out uh, HD map of the world and you need to know every millimeter pr uh, accuracy precision. Mm -hmm. What we do is we want to have a more natural style of uh, driving where the inputs that you use are uh, the data that you process, uh, the car would process would be imperfect and uh, you have uh, a rough idea of where you're going through a navigational map. So that's the level that allows us to be it's able to It's much harder. Scale. You have to worry about potholes. Yeah, then you, would, <laughs> you would have to worry about potholes and we wouldn't be able to see that. So, uh -huh. yeah. um, Given the, there's been a lot of deal making in this space. Mm -hmm. You guys are small, bright, smart team. It seems to me like someone might be sniffing, this kind of target one of the bigger guys would love to own. I mean, how, how do you think of wanting to stay independent versus, versus joining a bigger company? Yeah, so uh, this it's it's interesting because this space has changed so much in the last year and then prior to the year before that. Uh, when we were out fundraising, uh, we were almost doing tutorials on what deep learning is. Uh, and then when uh, we went back uh, for another round of fundraising, like everyone was fully, fully educated on what deep learning was and started to ask uh, much deeper questions. So it's great to see the level of education that mm -hmm. uh, VCs and uh, other companies are getting and understanding really the value of software in this space. Uh, you know, I think as we keep moving forward, who who will win this market will be software companies. Mm -hmm. I think there's going to be a new breed of uh, you know self-driving car companies that uh, that will change the way that cars are being made, the way that cities are being built, uh, the way that insurance is. Right, so I think every business will have be impacted, and uh, our fundamental, like as humans, uh, our fundamental um, relationship with transportation is going to be so drastically shifted. So that excites us at Drive, and we're right now just at the cups where we haven't even reached one percent. That it's so exciting to see, uh, you know, what can happen and what will happen uh, as we make contacts uh, with releasing these robots out into the wild. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a Deep learning first kind of model. Yeah. It seems to me like the the players that will win are the players at the biggest scale, and because um, it's about data and collecting data. Mm -hmm. And and so, it, why don't the Waymos of the world have an advantage there? I mean, it's just bigger companies, more resources, or do they have an advantage in your mind? Yeah. So uh, you know, the, it's a it's a it's a big discussion. I would say that uh, this is not a purely capital problem. Uh, you know, or else it would have been solved by now. Uh, this is fundamentally, uh, it, this, this industry is so new and requires so much original thought that's gonna happen. Uh, and I, I think a lot of this uh, area uh, comes with, you can't have too much stigma. So even at Drive, as we build up our team, it's very mindful to not have too much groupthink as we hire. Uh, you, we don't actually want uh, much auto DNA in how we build. I think uh, auto, their strength is uh, V and V, mm -hmm. and I think that they could be very helpful uh, adding value there. But in terms of how we build up our AI system, we look for people who come from uh, you know, different schools of thought, uh, different regulatory environments, and have seen this uh, telecom industry. So I think when we look at this space, it's uh, we're looking for people with very strong uh, disruptive thought uh, as we move out. And we have that luxury because we're building our team from the beginning and we don't have to carry the burden of, you know, like 10 years of legacy code and when a major AI breakthrough comes by, you know, you have to make that hard choice of turning a large ship around into going to a different direction. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we, we came in at the perfect time and it's been uh, fast to build up uh, different technologies. And uh, as you can see, uh, uh, Carl had brought up earlier, uh, the idea of uh, operational design domain uh, in the sense that what matters are, is not miles driven uh, and these vanity metrics, mm -hmm. but what matters is s different scenarios and being able to check off uh, what operational domain your product lives in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether it operates highway or urban or suburban, whether it's night or day, like these are the scenarios that customers who are our business fleets care about. And how much, um, how much do you have to make a choice in picking the domain at this phase of a company? And, and do you think that 
um, you know, high, uh, obviously highway driving and city driving are very different domains. But yeah. um, technically speaking, are there reasons to believe that there will be separate winners across the different domains? Oh, I absolutely believe uh, at this point in time there are going to be, you know, there's there's so much competition. Uh, there, the solution for trucking is not going to be the same solution for ride sharing, which is not going to be the same like solution for a private land golf cart. And why couldn't cart. a company do all of them, though? You know, I, since no one has solved it ever, uh, <laughs> to, to take on such, a, a startup has to stay focused um, and really solve a pain point. And if you really dig deep on a pain point, uh, different products will start to emerge uh, that satisfy uh, different customers. We're not at the point where self-driving cars is going to be commoditized right now. Uh, you know, I think that phase will happen much, much later. Uh, at this point in time, it's the company who wins is one that is able to stay focused, solve specific pain points, uh, as well as uh, you know, find customers that really love what they're building because, uh, you know, it's if you have to keep disengaging and you're getting jerked around during your ride. Yes, you got from point A to point B, but that experience was quite painful. And, you know, you may not turn on your autopilot. Mm -hmm. So so this this is the phase that we're in. There's a mix of um, really strong product as well as, uh, you know, really strong technology. And I think so much of the discussions have been focused on the technology because we've never solved this problem. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we have to bake in the safety factors and the product factors from day one. Mm -hmm. So if we're at 1% now, what? Not yet 1%. OK, we're, yeah. we're not we're, at 1%. Before the starting we're, we're before line. Before the starting yeah. line. Yeah. How do we get to the starting line? And if you could yeah. snap your fingers and have a handful of things be different tomorrow, what would they be? Yeah. You know, I, I think one, one of the biggest challenges uh, facing uh, autonomous vehicles, besides the tech, besides the you know regulation and all of that, uh, it's it's the most it's honestly is the most difficult problem across the board. Uh, but in my mind, what is uh, going to be the one of the biggest pieces of the conversation is uh, transparency in this industry and trust uh, from the general public, because most people's interaction with a self-driving vehicle will not be as a rider but more as uh, an average consumer looking at this product. And in a place where everyone is watching so carefully, there has mm -hmm. to be a level of transparency. Uh, you know, the self-driving car companies uh, need to band together because we're all in this fight and one person's accident uh, reflects on all of us. So I think it's about um, a level of transparency without vanity metrics. Uh, I don't think... Uh, the you know for instance the federal government does not need to mandate over us how we need to specifically do things um, but i think what they are encouraging is a level of transparency and at drive uh you know it's a discussion around what metrics really matter versus which which ones are just uh, for show uh, that that could skew the industry um, what ones actually matter for one our engineers to feel very proud and stand behind the product that they build mm -hmm. and two um, you know, metrics around the uh, public trust. So how do we gain trust of the businesses that want to work with us? How do we build up our credibility there? Uh, how do we build trust with the general public mm -hmm. uh, that showcases um, a, an understanding of how the AI uh, technology, uh, what it's thinking without uh, whether it's through visual cues, whether it's a way of the, these cars communicate. I think these are things that we're actively exploring because the world is dynamic and even as a human you know it's very frustrating sometimes as you are interacting inside your car um, trying to communicate with the other cars uh, there's a lot of very quick decision making and also change of direction that could lead to broken trust uh, with different AI systems. So what metrics at drive do you guys feel are the most important do you want to if you want yeah. people to standardize around? Yeah so you know I think uh, this is a larger part of the conversation. There, it, it's a very complicated thing. It's not a one short list of answers. Uh, you know, for instance, the conversation around miles driven uh, is one piece. It gives you a glimpse into the team and how they think through testing. Uh, one metric that isn't quite discussed very often is miles annotated, hmm. uh, which 
means that you actually label that data and that's what you use to train. Um, there's very quick ways to fake data. Uh, we've also had many different companies hand us petabytes of data being like, great, we've heard miles driven and data is important. Please annotate this for us. Mm. And we've learned that large uh, companies that do self-driving, you know, the bottleneck in the industry is not miles driven, but miles annotated. For one mile uh, driven, it takes some companies uh, 800 man hours to label that hour. So Labeling it with what kind of, I mean, with all sorts of things, can, I imagine, but... Yeah, I mean, uh, we've built in-house tools that uh, have semi-automated uh, way of labeling. Uh, other people have, you know, thousands of people in Sri Lanka drawing boxes around every pedestrian, every vehicle. Wow. Uh, this is how you train your AI system. Um, so, I mean, th th it's, it's the miles-driven metric uh, can give insight into mm -hmm. something about the company, but it's a very high-level metric. And, you know, I think as we move forward and as people actually deploy technology, it, start, it will start to get more granular on what actually matters. Mm -hmm. um, as people report out numbers uh, every year, you'll start seeing that some don't really matter and others matter more. Yeah, awesome. Um, Great. Okay, I think we just have time for one question. Okay, I'm just going to repeat that. Um, the question is, how much is the development and deployment of 5G um, a requirement for this next generation of fleet technology? Yeah, uh, that's a fantastic question. Uh, you know, a lot of it will depend on uh, what data you want to transfer back uh, to uh, to our Drive AI company, uh, so that we are able to better train instead of, for instance, mailing hard drives back and forth, which is the current method uh, that uh, companies uh, currently use. You know, I, I think it's, at, at this one time, I think there's a lot of discussion around teams that want to have 5G networks. Um, you know, at Drive right now, uh, since we're, all, we're looking globally, and uh, 4G is a current requirement, uh, 5G right now is a, uh, nice to have for us, uh, but I think it will become more and more critical as we move forward. Uh, right now, you know, information that we track are uh, where our fleets are and the the stream back to uh, each car. Uh, it's important, for instance, for uh, you know teleop stations as we build them out in the future. Excellent. Okay, Carol, we're going to say thank yeah. you so much. This has been really interesting. All right, you're Thanks welcome. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thank you.